I am ready, Mandy Jo. I just, if you could just clarify, so this is, this is a joint meeting, CRC and town council. There's a little switch here. I thought I was coming to CRC meeting. <laughs> you were coming to a CRC okay. and then we called it as a joint meeting. So it is, it is for both the town council as a whole and CRC. Okay, gotcha. So I'm gonna hear two calls to order. Yes. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. So Athena, we're, we're good to go when we're recording? Are we connected? We're broadcasting and recording. Excellent. So. All right, seeing as we have a quorum of the council present, I am calling the Committee of the Whole in relationship to the CRC meeting to order. And CRC has a quorum present, so I am calling the meeting of the Community Resources Committee for April 21st, 2020 at 2.01 p.m. to order. Um, Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, MGL chapter 30A section 20 allows us to hold this virtual meeting of the Community Resources Committee and the Town Council. This meeting is being recorded for future broadcast and all votes taken during the meeting, if there are any, will be by roll call. At this time, I'm gonna call upon each committee member and council member by name. At that time, I will confirm that you can hear me and we can hear you. Please remember to mute your mic after saying present. And I will start with the Community Resources Committee members. Shalini Val Milne. Present. Uh, Mandy Jo Haneke is present. Evan Ross. Present. Steve Schreiber. Present. Sarah Swartz. Present. And now we'll move on to the council members present. Alyssa Brewer. Present. Andrew Steinberg. Please unmute Andy. Present, sorry that. <laughs> Thanks. Present. Um, let me, Kathy Shane. Present. Um, did I miss anyone? Lynn Griesmer, present. Oh, sorry, Lynn. <laughs> sorry about that, Lynn. <laughs> right over your name. <laughs> so for members of the council and the committee, there is no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Athena or Pam know. Um, I think Athena is probably the better bet. That's right. I'm not sure we have Pam's cell, cell numbers to do that. To make a comment or ask a question, please click the raise hand button. If technical difficulties arise, as a result of re utilizing remote participation, I will decide how to address the situation. We may dis suspend discussion while we address technical issues and the minutes will note if a disconnection occurred. Those assisting the meeting will be monitoring committee meeting, committee members connections and if necessary, we will pause until we can get reconnected. We just lost Steve Schreiber. We did. We will wait a minute or two as I move to the next item to um, see if he reconnects. Because our next item of business is general public comment. Let's see if Steve connected through attendees. He did not. So Pam, for now, we're going to move to general public comment while we hope Steve can reconnect. Um, mm -hmm. Please just note that he's out for public comment and when he comes back in, we'll note. And if he has not come back in by that time, um, we'll pause the meeting and see if we can connect with him. Okay. So for general public comment, Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three, minute at the dis three minutes at the discretion of the chair um, based on the number of people who wish to speak. We will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during general public comment. To participate in public comment, um, you may, if you have joined the meeting by Zoom teleconferencing, you in, in in order to indicate you wish to make a comment, click the raise hand button. If you joined the meeting via the telephone, and Steve is back on now. Yes. Uh, if you join the meeting via the telephone to indicate you wish to make a comment, press star nine on your phone. During the public comment 
period. The chair will recognize members of the public. When called upon, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address. If you do not comply with this, we will end your public comment speaking period. And if you exceed your, public, your period of public comment time, we will end the comment period. Are there any members of the public who wish to make a comment? At this time, I see one raised hand. Um, so we are going to recognize Janet McGowan. I'm going to click the unmute button for you, Janet, and then you will have to agree to that in order to, for us to be able to hear you. And then please state your name and your address. So, Janet, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Thank you. Sorry. Um, my name is Janet McGowan. I live at 706 Southeast Street. I have a comment about um, the planning board and CRC working together on zoning changes. Should I make that now or wait until that item is on the agenda? You should make that now. Okay. So um, the, I know the goal of holding a joint meeting is to save time, but I think that this the idea of um, the planning board and the CRC doing meetings together for their public hearings may not achieve the efficiency that's wanted. Um, if a zoning change starts with the planning board, as most do, the planning board will wind up holding two public hearings, um, not just the one. Um, also, holding joint meetings will be hard to schedule. Um, it could add Wednesday night meetings to the CRC's already heavy agenda and the other the counselors on it. It's definitely harder to schedule a meeting with 12 people than seven and five separately. And it's definitely easier to talk and deliberate in a smaller group and discuss what is said during the public hearing. Um, I think having two separate hearings will give the public more opportunity to be involved and offer ideas. And it's easier for the planning board and the CRC to discuss what is said by the public and make the changes that are needed. So if the planning board has heard comment and decides to take the zoning change or proposal back and make significant changes, will it have to, and do, you know, say rewrite it and make changes, will it have to come back and have another joint hearing with the planning board and the CRC? Um, what if CRC comes and does different changes? So I think in a way, um, it would just be easier and more flexible to let the planning board go through its usual process for working on zoning changes and then just hand it off to the CRC and the town council. And I think it's very like, the missions of the planning board and CRC are very similar. I mean, they're common missions and we'll naturally collaborate with each other and work together. And keep, finally, I think keeping separate public hearings will keep the, the process of zoning changes more nimble and more flexible. And just, you know, and if it's not working out, we can always go back and look at different ways of working together. That's it, thanks. Thank you, Janet, for your comment. Are there any other uh, members of the public that would like to make public comment at this time? I am seeing none, so we will end the period for public comment. The next item on the agenda, the action items, there were none, so we will move on to our presentation and discussion items. The first presentation and discussion item is the COVID-19 and economic development. And for this, we are pleased to have present for this, for a presentation, um, the Business Improvement District Executive Director, Gabrielle Gould, and the Chamber of Commerce Executive Director, Claudia Pazmani. Um, if you give me a minute before you guys start, I will try to get the, um, hold on. I will try to get the presentation up and running. Um, so let's see, I think this will do it. And I think now everyone can see this as part of the meeting. And so I think we are ready to go, Claudia and Gabrielle. You'll have to unmute yourselves. Okay, here I am. <laughs> Thank you for having us. This is Claudia from the Amherst Area Chamber. And I'm Hi, Gabrielle Gould from Amherst Downtown Business Improvement District. So firstly, I do want to acknowledge the work of John Page, who worked with me at the Chamber as our membership and marketing director. And he has so 
beautifully presented the material that we wanted to convey today. Um, he's there, he's steadily supporting this work. Um, and this is a, really a wonderful opportunity for us to share a lot of the work that's been happening and, and more importantly, the collaboration, the incredible deep respect um, and collaboration that has uh, continued and even deepened with um, the, bed, the bid in the chamber during this really unique time. So um, I am so grateful to the team at the bid, which is um, Ann Tweedy and Gabrielle Gould and myself and John Page at the chamber. Um, you'll see here some amazing initiatives that we've put together. We don't feel like we're ever doing enough. This is just such tremendous devastation. I don't wanna under uh, sugarcoat anything. Um, I like to smile through things, but there is a lot of unsaid devastation underneath a lot of um, what we're gonna share today. Um, and anything that we've done in collaboration is in every possible effort to try every, you know, to uncover every piece of resource we can for our business community. Um, been a lot of calls, a lot of fears, worry, fear um, for all of our business owners. Gabrielle, did you want to say something? I, I will just second that. And I think I would say, let's go to the next slide. Yeah. Um, hey, Joe, thank you. So I, I think that um, this is a time, this is an opportunity um, that um, unfortunately has been forced upon us um, to really recreate Amherst um, as a, a complete town. And that yes, we are complemented by our college and our university, but we are our own entity as well. Um, we boast over 50 working farms, eight beautiful museums, three wonderful higher learning establishments and hundreds of local businesses. Um, we have a beautiful urban town center and I look forward to working with the town and the chamber and many of our community members to um, focus on that and um, bring us back from this when the time comes. Next slide. You want me to run, Claudia? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, in Go late March, and, and so much has changed since late March, we sent out a survey to our businesses, and these are some of the facts and the numbers that we got from them. Um, over 70% of our downtown businesses said that they will not survive through May. Again, this was in March. This was before Governor Baker um, closed non-essential businesses and before our restaurants moved to takeout. Uh, we have a new um, joint survey going out to all of the chamber and all of the bid businesses. And um, so far we've gotten a little under 50 responses from that. Um, it was only sent out yesterday. And again, to reiterate what Claudia is saying, it is devastating, the responses we are getting. Um, the, um, I, I, is it best for me to read these, Mandy Jo, or does everybody see this? Um, so you could summarize them, might be the best way to do it. Um, the tip jar we'll get into, but we've had over 77 unemployed um, hourly and tipped workers sign up for that. Um, Everybody knows we have lost the critical months. Um, I told someone today that this is like the Cape and Islands losing July and August. That's what we have lost when we lost April and May. Um, I also believe fully that Amherst was hit two weeks earlier than the rest of Massachusetts when we had the closure of Amherst College and then swiftly on that UMass. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Claudia, so, go ahead. Okay, so I mean, obviously, um, if, if you haven't seen, there's a recent um, letter from the chancellor. There is a huge possibility uh, from both Amherst College and UMass uh, for fall semester being virtual. Um, and so there are huge financial implications for the town, um, whether it's empty residential and commercial units, uh, local, you know, receipts, meals tax, room tax continue, you know, will just continue to continue to decline as well as even parking revenue um, and the, the huge devastation of the, the entire student population not returning. I mean, it is obviously a trickle down effect and there is not one industry that wouldn't be affected. Certainly the hospitality, real estate, property management and more. Next slide. Um, I'll just kick us off and then uh, Gabrielle can pick up. We really, again, we're working together. These are just our effort to be as 
much of a resource as possible to our members. Uh, so we created quickly, John cultivated and created this uh, and curated this uh, COVID information page. I know the town has been an incredible partner and they are linking to it as well. And they have an amazing uh, resource page. So just as many resources, whether it's funding, whether it's unemployment, whether it's um, you know issues on housing. Um, we created this open for business, really using open source pieces and saying, okay, well, who's open? It was such a quickly changing situation that we couldn't keep up. So this is an open source document that we can change daily and a business can go in and ex ex change it themselves and edit. And the idea is who's open, who's doing takeout, um, who's available to you, and just to keep and sustain those businesses that are still open. Um, and of course, we had a support local restaurant initiative that we did, and the Gazette was very generous. We were able to place ads, um, and um, it's been shared. It's probably one of the most shared <laughs> items that we've put out as a bid and chamber. And again, that's a shared list. It's all across the Amherst area that's, that's being focused. And of course, the initial survey, and then again, another economic impact survey that was just distributed uh, this week. Gabrielle? We also created a virtual tip jar, which was for uh, hourly employees and tipped employees to sign up for themselves and be able to um, receive quote unquote tips from people, um, your favorite bartender, your masseuse at Elements, um, other, other things like that. Um, we have 77 people who joined that. Um, the restaurants and uh, hair salons, et cetera, sent that to their employees, hoping to get them a little bit of relief. Um, Feed the Front Lines was a um, downtown Northampton Business Association initiative. Um, they called us, we joined on, and the restaurants, Wheelhouse, Crazy Noodles, Bistro 63, Pasti Basta, Buen Uisana, and Mission Cantina, all from Amherst, immediately jumped in. Um, today at 4.30, we will be going to Pasti Basta to pick up 30 individual fresh healthy meals to bring to the frontline workers at Cooley Dickinson. Um, this is lunch and dinner every day uh, for those um, frontline workers at Cooley Dickinson. Um, next slide, please. Claudia? Sure, so between the bid and chamber staffs, we've been really trying to offer as much coaching and assisting as we can. We are not the experts, but we've been engaged and networked with so many of them and putting our businesses in touch with them. And, and whether it's been the PPP, the SBA, um, We've let it be known, the MSBDC staff, who's normally available in our office, uh, they've offered services. The Valley CDC is also, um, their small business development team is ready to work with our local businesses. So again, just in the effort to continue resources right now, there are so many unanswered questions um, and obviously so many uh, holes in the PPP program. And go ahead, next slide. And, the, the programming continues. You know, we at the Chamber do a lot of networking events, um, but right now it's all about how can we be a resource to everyone and how can the, how can the bid and the Chamber work together. So we've done remote working uh, tips and tools, um, mindfulness sessions, thanks to Shalini, um, wellness resources, weekly leadership and crisis webinars, uh, website, digital marketing. We did today and that will be a series for um, because the online piece is so critical right now with all eyes on our computers 24-7. Uh, uh, the website presence of our businesses is as critical as their uh, storefront at, at this moment. That is their storefront. And so we really are taking that seriously and trying to offer them as many free tools as possible. Um, and also walking them through this to get, you know, shovel ready when it, the time comes to open their doors. Um, and the it has some exciting events, the sidewalk chart art. Why don't you talk about those, Gabrielle? Um, so we are also trying um, together with the chamber to find happy and light moments. Um, May 4th was the original day that everybody was told that things might go back to normal. Um, I know that the school sent out May the 4th be with you. We all know that that has changed. So what we would like to do is recreate a luminaria downtown, um, light candles in blue bags up and down Maine and Pleasant. And uh, we have ordered big, huge blue bows and we would love to do an 8 p.m. invite everybody to come into town and drive and honk for our essential workers and our um, first responders, uh, the DPW, uh, the town workers and police and fire department. So we wanna add a little bit of light 
um, to downtown and we are also going to be working with North and um, South Amherst on this. Um, so everyone from way down at Mission Cantina all the way to the Mill District and in between. So we're hoping that that is something that brings a little bit of light. Um, we're also reaching out to a bunch of different artists and finding out if we can do in, in safe teams some uh, chalk art, some sidewalk art um, once this rain is finished to bring some joy and get people on the nicer days to safely go outside, socially distant, but to see some artwork and some creativity. Um, we are also reaching out to some musicians, thinking that it would be really fun to use uh, maybe some of the float trucks from the UMass uh, homecoming parade and have our musicians drive around town on the back of the truck safely um, and bring some music around town, drive up and down all the streets of Amherst and bring some joy on, on perhaps maybe a Sunday. Um, as the weather is getting better. So um, again, just trying to bring some, some joy and some lightness um, to the residents of Amherst. Next slide. This is you. So the, the, the biggest thing that we are doing and that we hope is going to be a help is a resiliency grant program for um, Amherst wide. Um, this is a collaboration between the Amherst Area Chamber and the Amherst Bid. Um, the Downtown Amherst Foundation was created originally to become an arts and culture builder for our downtown. Our first priority was going to be to raise the funds to build and donate to the town a performing arts shell um, with a maintenance foundation and a programming um, fund. Uh, we pivoted quickly on this and switched the mission around. Um, if you could go to the next slide. Mandy Jo, thank you. Um, we have created a committee of um, five who will be able to look at this um, grant applications and allot the, the funds to the, to the businesses um, based on our uh, application process and our guidelines, which are not 100% ready. They will be by the end of the week. We are looking to start taking applications for the first wave of grant applications on May 1st. Um, although it does say here that we have raised over $80,000, that is true. Um, we also have a $50,000 um, additional grant coming in. It will be a matching grant. So we are up to $130,000. And if we match that, we will be at 180. Um, our hope is to raise 250 by May 1st and to keep going. Our first wave of grants will be to sustain businesses in this time of closure. And we are hoping that our second wave is to reopen businesses. Um, and that will be up to Governor Baker and um, the, the scientists working hard, but that's our hope. Thank you. Yeah, that's an, it's an amazing opportunity and um, we're looking for investors. So what are we doing? We're also really um, advocating for our businesses. We have been participating uh, with, and connecting with Zoom meetings with local, starting, you know, keeping it local, starting with our town council president, Lynn, um, town manager, and assistant town manager, weekly conversations with Mindy and Senator Comerford's office, who've been extraordinarily um, accessible and transparent conversations um, for both the bid and chambers and our sister bids and chambers across the country and some of the larger national um, bids and chambers, um, the EDCs, uh, conversations with the small business development speakers, uh, conversation with Speaker DeLeo, calls to the Housing and Economic Development, Keneally and Labor and Workforce Development, both Secretary Keneally and Acosta have also been very accessible. Um, I've had very specific questions I've forwarded from businesses, so they've been very helpful. Um, you know, really, there's just been so much to sift through so quickly, and uh, they've been really, there's been just so much to lean on. And uh, bi-weekly check-ins with Senator Markey, Warren, Congressman McGovern, Neal, uh, and letters, phone calls, and virtual town halls. And um, also some inquiries with some neighboring CDBG um, offices, especially the Boston CDBG conversation. So again, to inform us on how we can better um, our working relationship with the town and how we can work as a team together to get those monies out as quickly as possible as those emergency CDBG relief monies. Next slide. Uh, do you want to go on this one? So we um, worked with um, the bids across Massachusetts and put together a, um, a, a, a um, sorry, what's the word I'm looking for? 
petition um, to go to the state and federal level. Um, it was a grassroots relief for mainstreets.org. Um, the uh, Boston um, Central Square bid has an amazing and very large staff and we're able to put together a website for this and get the petition launched. It's been incredibly successful. Um, I, I believe four of these right now are in legislation um, and, and the rest we are continuing to, to lobby for and to push. Um, so that, that's been wonderful. Um, again, the you know, sort of demand for increase of the PPP, especially um, our, our numbers from Amherst are not good for that. We are not getting the support we need from those. Um, unfortunately, the money ran out. I understand today at 4 p.m. they are voting on um, another wave of funds, so hopefully that, that does help. Um, again, Claudia, the, the chamber and the bid have been answering questions on individual basis. Um, we start every conversation with we are not um, financial planners and we walk people through what is available to them and walk them through the processes, but um, we are not advising people on how to, you know, run their businesses and, and where to go. Um, I think that is good. Next slide. So this is really where um, conversations with the town has taken a nice and a positive turn and really trying to figure out how we can all work together to reopen our economy. What does that look like? How do we even start those conversations? Um, so utilizing, and, and when we say this opportunity, downtown is quiet. There are no cars. There are no, you know, there's very few pedestrians. How can we maximize um, the fact that it is empty for a stronger uh, and more resilient reopening of our town? So it comes from the most basic points of power washing and sealing our sidewalks. Um, and, um, and also some bigger picture, Planning. So, for example, uh, talking about permitting, outdoor seating, and ease of altering licensing permits for this new reality. How can we adapt, be more adaptable? Will people want to go inside and sit in restaurants? There's a little window of opportunity with us. If we are opening in the summer, uh, summer months, that perhaps the outdoor seating is the best thing to take advantage of and people will be more comfortable, given whatever guidelines we will have at that moment. Um, again, these are all in the framework of whatever guidelines come down from the state. Um, regarding, um, you know, physical distancing. Um, and also talking about, can there be a new version of the downtown farmer's market coming online soon? Um, not normal, not, we're beyond their original start date, I believe, but sometime maybe in May, June. Um, so working on the permitting and the alcohol in the common, um, looking at our parking, revisiting, uh, you know, what that looks like right now and what, what that's gonna look like when we come back. Um, how to continue permitting the ZBA and the PB in an efficient manager, in manner. Um, and then again, utilizing those emergency CDBG funds, how can we get those out quickly? Can, we, can that really benefit our small businesses? Um, and also, there's going to be some new other health and safety protocols. Are we going to be prepared with masks, um, temperature, you know, taking instruments and portable hand washing stations, those kinds of things to get us as ready um, to make people feel as safe as possible and wanting to come downtown and coming to our businesses and our, 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 our sources. So not just downtown, but, you know, obviously Amherst wide. Next slide. Gabrielle, the placemaking. So um, again, we would, we would like to revisit the placemaking for Amherst as a whole. Um, the chamber is looking at uh, doing all new banners in downtown and we are looking um, for permission from, I believe the town manager, but it might be town council to do cafe lightings up and down uh, South and North Pleasant and down Main Street, um, as you can see in this picture here. Um, that's sort of what it would look like. Um, again, sort of being ready to open and inviting and beautiful. We are working, the bid is going to be doing extra plantings this year. Uh, we're working with Alan Snow on the tree wells, um, just creating as much beauty and cleanliness and light as we can in the downtown so that when it is time for people to return to downtown in whatever manner that is, um, it's, it's a beautiful, open, airy, clean, and inviting space. Um, again, just really fostering that sense of community. Resilient Amherst or, or Amherst Strong, however we want to put it, um, what is the messaging that we together as the town and the chamber and the bid in our community do? Um, supporting our frontline work rollers, and uh, those are some repeats, so we'll skip those and go to the next slide.
Claudia? <laughs> So, you know, obviously all of this is um, what we need from you is is really um, having an open mind and an open for business mind, <laughs> you know, because for us to experience any type of economic uh, vitality in our resurgence as a vibrant and dynamic and sustainable local economy, um, we're going to have to work together like we've never done before. My sense is that you know, these are, this is a time to fast track certain zoning, permitting, parking, uh, utilization of public parking. There's a lot here that can be done now um, in the short term so that we can prepare for some longer term, we hope, resiliency. For us, it's about a resilient Amherst. Um, we've heard only the sad stories and the challenges that our businesses are going through. And um, we are hoping that there is a willingness to think big um, in all these very small ways, we can think very big for our businesses and for the resilient Amherst. So we hope it goes from relief. You know, the micro grant program is about relief to resilience. Can we get there? Um, and I do believe we can get there. And Gabrielle and I believe that as we all work together, we've had enormous, um, tremendous support with the town working already. And so we just hope that this continues and it, it turns into real action um, for a resilient Amherst. Gabrielle, do you want to add? I, I would just wrap that up with um, saying that uh, we have an opportunity here um, to really come together and look at the way that uh, zoning, um, planning, DRB, um, mm -hmm. processes, permitting have, have been done. And there is so much that comes down from a state level that is where every uh, municipality and town in, in Massachusetts does and there are things that are very specific to Amherst and I hope that we can work together listen to our business owners to our developers to our um, sort of boots on the ground entrepreneurs um, as to what can help them be prepared to come back what can make people say if I have an opportunity to open a new business um, in anywhere in Massachusetts especially Western Massachusetts I want it to be in Amherst um, we want to be truly open for business. Um, we want to be shovel ready when the time comes. And we look forward to working with you, the town council, and with our town manager and assistant town manager and the entire second floor at the town building. Um, we, we really look forward to this. It's the only silver lining that could come out of this. Thank you for having us. We're here to help. So thank you. Um, I, it's a stark, you know, your presentation is a stark reminder of how much the non-essential business shutdown affects everyone um, downtown, but individuals, businesses, the surveys you've been doing, it's been a fantastic job on your part to try and get some of that data on how it's going to affect our own residents um, and our own businesses and all. Um, at this time, I'm going to unshare my screen so I can actually see people. Um, so I have to figure out how to do that. The, the PDF that we just went through, the presentation we just went through, will be added into the packet. We got it about an hour and a half or so ago. So it will get into the packet on the website as soon as we can um, for people to see. Um, and the information for contacting both Claudia and Gabrielle and the Downtown Amherst Foundation is there. It's on the screen right now. Mm -hmm. um, at this time, I am going to open up this conversation that hopefully we're going to have to um, all the counselors for any questions they may have of Claudia um, or Gabrielle, um, any comments we have, any suggestions or thoughts on what, um, you know, the original reason for putting this onto the CRC agenda was because there was a thought that, well, what do we, the Community Resources Committee is now, you know, has economic development in its charge. What should the Community Resources Committee be thinking and then therefore recommending to the council to be thinking about on how to be ready for um, economic development and promoting that when we come out of this crisis. So at this time, if any counselors would like to make a comment or question or anything, um, please, raised your hand and I will recognize you in that order. I see Kathy. So Kathy, please unmute yourself. Hey, I, first of all, I wanna thank you for this presentation and the set of slides. There are 
a lot of initiatives you have going on right now in terms of a foundation and a tip jar, and I'm not sure that those are broadly known. So I'm wondering if there could be a very short version, and then if we talk to the town manager in IT, post it somewhere on the town website. And uh, up in uh, District 1, we have a neighborhood association, and they would send it out. You know, they're not going to send out a large chart pack, but something very condensed on, you know, how you can help um, support local businesses. So we're getting periodically this one or that one is open for takeout, but I don't think we have a laundry list and as you said that's often changing regularly so just a a very condensed version of of what you've said that is active and i very much like the idea of um thinking in terms of how can we be, be best positioned to be opening um and i'm assuming you're talking with dpw with the town manager um, i've actually seen a lot of work going on that i would call sprucing up <laughs> you know um not as much in north amherst where we have sidewalks that my brother talks about it's i'll get my forest bike out it's just like riding a trail but um or we don't have any at all but you know but just really thinking about making things easier downtown and thinking about where we have go slow versus go faster procedures that could be going faster if if there's some way of expediting with um group activity so I, I really i really thank you both for this presentation thank you and we will absolutely get a condensed version of how to help and it would be fantastic if it can get shared widely um, we're doing our best with we'll be on monty's radio show and a couple of other things um, with our own pr but Every share helps. Thank you, Alyssa. Thank you, and thank you. This is so helpful. Um, one question I have is, I have been known for a long time as the person who says to the town managers over time, stop hiring people. We can't afford long-term commitments. But of course, there are always exceptions. And I'm looking at the position of our second ever economic development director. And I'm wondering what kinds of discussions you've had at the bid and at the chamber about the importance of that position, given where we are and given the extreme demands that are being placed on the town manager, assistant town manager, and in fact, all of our other uh, top line staff. Um, I can share that b before uh, all of this happened, uh, the town manager was very open with to both organizations and met with both of us and our boards to um, receive input. And we felt it was extraordinarily invaluable to have that position filled um, and with some guidelines and things that we saw were priorities. Uh, and that has not changed. We haven't really had any more conversation on that. As far as the chamber is concerned, I'll let Gabrielle speak for the bid, but um, we very much agree that uh, it is a position that should be filled and probably more so than now, but I don't know where it stands and, and Dave might be able to answer that better. I did ask at our last meeting with Lynn, Dave and Paul uh, where it was and Paul um, just said it's, you have all been doing a lot. There's been a lot on everybody's plates and to be very honest, that position and its hiring um, is was at, at that moment last Thursday down on the list. Um, from our perspective, I second Claudia, I have never, there has never been a more important time for that person and for it to be um, a unicorn. Uh, that's the best way I can put it. This town needs an economic development person and a strong one at that. And Shalini. So again, um, before I say anything, I, I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of everyone, how grateful we are for the bid and the chamber and all of you. Uh, I don't know for everyone, but it really felt there were this glimmer of excitement and hope seeing those images of what our downtown can look like. So I really appreciate that. My question was, um, you know, in addition to everything that you're doing, would you be able to offer to the town a list of when you say shovel ready and you have broad categories like permits and zoning could you provide us what you think or what you're hearing from the businesses uh what kind of zoning changes would be 
you know, uh, have been, would be beneficial and what sort of permitting changes or anything more specific that we can really give our attention to and then look at, uh, you know, what's possible. Yes, we have reached out to uh, quite a large swath of people and we are compiling their responses and putting them into a succinct list um, that will be divided into, you know, different categories. Um, and we basically, the way I put it is I said, if, if Amherst had a hard restart and you wanted to come back into business, what would that look like? And I have to say the responses have been very, very thoughtful and we look forward to presenting that. We just didn't want to overwhelm the CRC today with that. Yeah, and I would second that we have a list going, a very detailed list of some of those changes that we're thinking of. And I, I mentioned that we are meeting weekly and so we will present those to um, the town manager as well. But uh, and we'll start there, but we do have a very detailed list that, that is ongoing. It is started. It, it would be very helpful if you could forward that on to CRC too, especially the portions that that relate to things that would need council action. So that in you know would be anything zoning, um, you know potential. You talked about the cafe lights, um, anything that public way use on a more permanent basis, um, not not a short term basis, um, but anything that would be slightly more permanent, things like that, so that. Maybe we can start thinking about and and working from our end to to look into those those items. We absolutely will. Thank you, uh, Steve. Hi. So plus three or four or whatever to the great presentation. So I, I think I have three points here. So one <laughs> one is um, we're trying to impart to our graduating architecture students that things like density and public transportation and are not bad things and social distancing is not a good thing. So while that's appropriate for this emergency, um, that should not be etched into their hippocampus as some a way to build community. So I think that that's one of my concerns is that there'll be this fear of density and that fear might then start to drive certain um, ideas for zoning changes. So the um, along that same line and maybe on a different track of that, I would imagine that all the small towns and cities of the Northeast are going to see a resurgence of interest from the really big cities that have been hit hard by this. And there have been uh, numerous newspaper articles already about how there's a resurgence of interest in places like Pittsburgh, you know, sort of the small, smaller cities from people from New York. But I hope that we can position ourselves as being a really attractive place for people that are looking for an alternate to, you know, the really big cities. So basically the, you know, kind of urban life without, you know, accessible to the big cities, but not in the big city. And the third one is commitment to public projects. So we know, so this is not specifically in the purview of the bid or the chamber, but there are certain public projects that are coming down the pipeline, some of which are critical for, in my opinion, for economic development. Um, the library, for example, you can argue is, has a very big possibility of serving as a public economic driver for the private businesses in downtown. So I'll leave it at that, but thank you again for the great presentation and I look forward to the continuing discussion. I, I was speaking with a friend who is in Manhattan as a as a city planner, and um, the the sort of idea of urban flight to areas like ours is going to be very real. Um, people are going to leave those cities that have been hit hardest, and I think that that is something that um, is again a, a silver lining for our area. And Steve and I could not agree with you more on the public projects, and I. I, I think one of my biggest fears as a resident, a parent, and a community member of Amherst is that those projects are going to get um, delayed or, or, or not put up front. And I hope that that's not the case, especially um, the library and the school. But then, of course, as soon as I say that, I think the safety and um, concern of our DPW and our fire. So again, all four. Thank you. Kathy. Um, I just Steve Steve's talking about um, places of investment that support uh, community and support uh, businesses, but also households. It's become clear that the web 
look at the way we're all meeting right now is ever more critical and there are places in town that it's less accessible. I know a small group, actually, they're techie people up in Vermont that have been doing fiber optic installations for all the small towns and small businesses, both lowering the cost and increasing the speed. And we've done a piece for downtown Amherst, um, but it's not broadly accessible. So I'm just, um, I think some creative thinking on what would it take to, um, you know, so not just locate in downtown, but locate anywhere around our area that you could be um, having high speed internet. So when the kids have been home from school doing it, but there may be people that want to split their time from going to the office and working at home. Um, and the Comcast rates, anyone who's on Comcast uh, knows what those rates look like. You know, but just trying to think of easy hold on this. Um, so that's just a, a thought, and, and as I, the, the friends I have that did this knew a lot about fiber optics, and they've tied together 30 towns, um, you know, bringing them into a community shared resource. So it's, it's something that has been percolating around outside of all of us for a while, but I have no idea what the barriers are or what it would take. So it's not just an Amherst, but it would be a Pelham Hadley, you know, a, a surrounding area. And is that something that federal funds would help cover? When when they first applied, when ERA came online, um, mm -hmm. you know, there was intranet was part of the thing that was um, an eligible project. Unfortunately, the way it was administered, there was a preference for the biggies versus the smallies. You know, so a Comcast would get it or a Spectrum would get it in New York rather than, or Verizon, rather than some of these small top. But I don't know um, if the federal government is rethinking that and actually putting some money in. I mean, for the tribes up in Alaska, for all sorts of reasons, the federal government uh, made it widely available because communities don't even have a road, let, let a little other way. So they do um, remote medical care and doctors and dentists where you get a dental assistant out in a remote area working with a dentist in Anchorage. But that was all paid with federal money because they had uh, tribes that uh, were so isolated in tiny towns. So I, I don't know the answer on whether there'll be a federal pot of money or a state pot of money to tap into, but I think it's a real engine that's supportive of different ways of working as well as businesses moving out of central urban areas. Thank you. Uh, Shalini. Uh, okay, yes. So uh, as we're thinking about these creative ways of revitalizing our downtowns and village centers, one thing that I just want to put out there for all of us is uh, how we can do that in a sustainable way. And, uh, you know, I wonder if in your networks, in the chambers and the bid, if there are people we can draw upon to think about, like as you were talking about the lights, the thing that was coming to my mind is that's a lot of electricity out there, it's amazing, but is there a way to do that, that it's sustainable? And so we can incorporate those values uh, even as we are, you know, wanting to make these changes or smart streets, for example. Like I think everything that you're proposing is gonna make it more walkable and we're thinking of making our downtowns and village centers be those hubs of activity and culture and so forth. So as you're drawing information, getting, if, it, if you are able to, and of course that's for all of us also to figure out how we can do all of this in a, in a cool way, sustainable way. Those lights are LED and we can put solar little thingies on them. <laughs> Are there any other questions or comments at this time for Gabrielle or Claudia or, or frankly for other counselors to have a conversation about what we as a community resources committee and then a council um, could be, should be, might want to be thinking about as we work our way through this extended shutdown and then the, the reopening of the economy? Chris, or is that Rob? one of the two with hands up. It is Chris Brestrup. Hi, everybody. I just wanted to let you know that 
you know, while the downtown may be very quiet, things are happening in the outlying areas. Um, developments are moving ahead through the permitting process. Um, John Robleski just got a, a permit to build 24 units of apartments on a property that's near the railroad tracks down by the BFW. And Amir McChi is working on building a project on Southeast Street. And there are various other things trickling through the permitting process. So we're here and we're working with applicants and trying to keep projects moving ahead. And um, that's not, it's often not really related to the downtown, but it is part of economic development for the town as a whole. So I just wanted to let you know that and sort of in a reassuring manner that um, all business hasn't stopped where we are um, helping applicants to move through the permitting process and get their projects going. And as a sign off from, from the bid, I just wanna to say to Chris and Rob and everybody on the second floor, thank you for that. And we are aware of those. John and I spoke a couple of days ago um, and I, I've been working with him through the permitting process. Um, and I just wanna say again, the Amherst Foundation and this Resiliency Fund is for Amherst, all of Amherst. Um, we are not looking at this anymore as uh, lines. Um, we are firm believers that all of these tides have to rise and that we have to come through this together. Um, so we are now Resilient Amherst. Um, it is the bid and the chamber working together. Um, and I don't look at anything anymore with, oh, that's not in my bid. I don't, I, I can't focus on that. Um, so I just want to make that very clear. The majority of our businesses are in our downtown, which is normal for any area, but um, our support and our uh, passion and our compassion is for all of Amherst. It's for everybody right now. I mean, my heart breaks for Italy, um, my heart breaks for Amherst. So we are in this together. Um, and I just want to reiterate that, that this is no longer a bid issue. This is an Amherst issue and we are all working together. Right. It's resilient, resilient Amherst. And Claudia and Chris, we have a couple more hands, but before I recognize those hands, I want to make sure Pam um, knows that two more counselors have joined our list for the minutes. <laughs> and that is Darcy Dumont is now on, and so is um, Pat DeAngelis. I'm scanning the list. I think they are the only two at this point that have all now joined. I don't know when they came on, so sorry, I, but I just noticed them. Um, but I thought I'd mention that so that they can get into our minutes. Um, so. I'm Alyssa, I'm gonna skip over you for now. I'll come back because um, Darcy has her hand up and she hasn't had a, a comment or a question yet. So Darcy. Um, I just wanted to uh, take the chance to thank you for your presentation. I'm really, you know, it, it actually brings tears to my eyes to hear you talking about how you are going to try to bring joy through the arts to people in town um, through music and art and so on. I think that's wonderful. Um, I also wanted to just mention that, um, and thank you, Shalini, for bringing this up also, is just to make sure that we're all integrating our different plans. Um, the Energy and Climate Action Committee is going to be uh, putting forward their um, proposed plans probably sometime in the summer. And so we just want to make sure that it, what we're doing is all uh, as far as a transportation and, and uh, energy use and, and et cetera, all integrated and all part of the same plan. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Alyssa. Great. This is just a little tiny thing in comparison to all the big things we're working so hard to do. But the little tiny thing is, just as on the town website, we do not recreate everything the state provides in terms of COVID-19 materials. We just send people to the states as they continue to update, then it's updated at the state level. I don't want to see us starting to have condensed versions of what the bid and chamber material is on our website. I want to definitely drive people to their website so that they can see things as they're unfolding and they can see things in detail. We hear at every single meeting we ever go to, I don't know how to find that out. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to subscribe to town things. And so I want to continue to teach people that there are lots of different resources and we should definitely link to those resources, but we should not be trying to have a one stop fits all. 
Thank you, Alyssa. Lynn. Head on mute. Sorry. Uh, first of all, uh, Claudia and Gabrielle, thank you so much for putting the presentation together. Um, this is, we've now been meeting on a regular basis for about the last three weeks. And as we've been doing that with Paul and myself and Gabrielle and uh, David and also uh, Claudia, we've been really trying to hone in, well, what is the town's role? And then in, in, in that, what is the town manager's role versus what is the town council's role? And so, and then as we do that, sort out which committee does it go to, whether it's um, actually public ways now would go to TSO and um, the other stuff that we're talking about more on the permitting side or the uh, zoning side would of course come to CRC. So this is really, uh, I can only say, I've just been so proud of our chamber and our bid and what they have been doing for the businesses and how they have been reaching out with creative ideas for helping to bring Amherst back again. And I see this as a terrific way to kick off this conversation with the council. When, when other counselors learned that you were going to be at this meeting, that's why we ended up with so many people here. We had to call it as a special meeting of the council. And uh, we look forward to that ongoing cooperation in any way that we can help. Thank you. At this time, are there any other comments, questions, or Gabrielle or Claudia, are there anything you want to add based on what you've heard? Thank you, everybody, for taking the time to hear this. Um, and again, thank you to John Page and Ann Tweedy, who are working behind the scenes and don't get their pictures up here with us today. I'm not seeing anything else. Yeah, I yeah, just I'm want not... to thank you for the unity that I'm hearing. And, you know, this is this is one of those where we're in this together really has never meant more than it does today. And I really want to thank Lynn and Dave and the town manager, Paul, who is, I think is now on the call for meeting with us and being open to working together. Because honestly, I, I, it's, I know it's, you know, we've heard a lot, but stronger together, there is just no better way to get through this. And, and as the chair of the CRC, I want to thank you know, as Lynn just did too, and as everyone has, both Gabrielle and Claudia and, and John. Um, John sent us the, the presentation ahead of time and we said, we can't access it, send us another way, and we were able to get to it. Um, and he's been doing a fantastic job as well as both Gabrielle and Claudia. You guys have been doing a fantastic job trying to get out there on the front of this. And as I said, getting the data, figuring out, talking to all the businesses, seeing what they need what this, this, how this is gonna impact them, and then asking them what you guys can do and advocate to us as town council and you know to the executive side to the town manager and all on how we can come back stronger from this from where we were as a town um, so i want to thank you guys for taking the time to put the presentation together for attending today um, and for answering all our questions but also giving us an idea of where we stand which is is kind of grim and bleak at this point um, but hopefully as we move forward we will figure out a way to as I said, come back stronger as a town as a whole. Um, so thank you for all of that. Um, and at this time, I think we're going to move on to our next discussion. Um, so that next discussion is on zoning. Feel free, Gabrielle and Claudia, to stay. <laughs> but we are we are moving on to a discussion on the zoning bylaws. This is. Um, as a result of a referral from the council that was to recommend for a, recommend a plan for approaching the zoning bylaw revisions. And um, we, this is still part of the whole town council meeting. Um, so at this point, I'm going to attempt to share a screen um, to show people some stuff about the zoning thing. And so the first thing I'm going to share is a flow chart that the Community Resources Committee a couple meetings ago, three or four meetings ago, voted to recommend that the council adopt that has not come to the council yet at the chairs of CRC's request because we realized this might not be complete. And so um, a further discussion has ensued. 
but this flowchart that is being shown right now um, is intended to start at the time where amendments are either received from a petition as an initiative petition received from a counselor who might have an amendment to the zoning bylaws that they want to propose or received from the planning board or planning staff in a fairly formal and nearly final in their opinion um, draft and this then shows sort of the steps that need to go through to get that from that sort of near final draft or proposal from a counselor or a, a resident to a bylaw vote at the council. And that includes a whole lot of things. And so we put this together. It's been through the planning board for comment, but as I said, it has not been to the council. Uh, there's a spot in the lower left corner that says, if things are coming from the town staff, planning staff or the planning board, there needs to be some sort of collaboration um, and a collaborative process before it makes it to this flow chart. Last week, last meeting, the Community Resources Committee began discussions on um, what was a different document that was created to talk about, um, and this is what I'm gonna try and find the next one. Um, and so I'm going to stop that and see if I can come up with the next document. Yeah, so let's see if I can share this one. I'm not sure where it is. Um, so let me figure out how to get that one up. Let's see. And this next document, for some reason, where is it? Well, we'll do the screen for now. Is this document. Um, and this was a document we started discussing at the last Community Resources Committee meeting about what might um, zoning bylaws that originate within the town staff or at the planning board level look like in terms of collaboration and timing and all of that. Um, I'm going to move to the second page, which helps sort of explain this a little bit. Um, and this was a document that I drafted after talking with the planning board chair. It has not been to planning board yet. It is not ready to go to planning board. It was just a first discussion at the last CRC meeting. We're going to continue that discussion today about not just this document, but zoning amendments in general. And this was one that suggested potentially having zoning changes um, come to and, and hearings held three times a year in general, instead of potentially any time a change is ready. Um, and so you'll see that with some potential timelines and all. And the committee just started discussing whether it likes that idea, whether it doesn't like that idea. Um, whether there might be another way to approach zoning bylaw changes. At the last meeting, we heard from Chris Brestrup, our planning director, that Northam in response to a question that Northampton deals with zoning changes fairly differently than this. Um, that in Northampton, the planning staff brings zoning changes to the equivalent of sort of the CRC committee of the council as a first look, not as a last look. That that really the planning board's only involvement in zoning changes is the required state hearing. Um, that, that they really, it, when the planning staff believes a change is needed, the first people they tend to look to is the council in Northampton, not the planning board. Um, so we started hearing about different ways to be doing zoning changes last meeting. And so we're gonna continue that discussion today. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen for now. We can always do that later if we need to see it again. Um, but I, I'd like to start off with um, first recognizing that we have both Rob Mora and Chris Brestrop in attendance today for any questions. Um, I'd first like to ask them if they have anything they would like to say. And I'll, I'll also ask Dave Zomek the same thing because he is here as our liaison to town staff too. So we're gonna start with, um, with Chris, Rob and then Dave, if you have anything to say, unmute your mic and you can start talking. I'll try and watch who the unmutes are for that. Um, and it looks like Dave might have something to say. So Dave. 
I, I know Chris just had to step out for a minute, so we, we may want to just give her a few minutes to get back in, in her chair. She had to go pick up something from an applicant. Um, I actually don't have anything substantive to say about where you are with this, with this, um, the two different charts, if you will. Rob may want to weigh in, but we might give Chris a few minutes. Maybe there are some counselor questions in the meantime. Thank you for that. Chris had warned me she was stepping out of 2.55 till about 3.05 and I wasn't paying attention to the clock. Um, so Rob, would do you, do you have anything you want to say right now? I know you missed our mat last meeting where we sort of brought this up, but um, you know, things about your, I know you're working on some zoning changes right now um, and you've had experience in other towns. Is there anything you'd like to add to sort of how that process works in other towns? Uh, I, I really don't have anything to add at this point to that uh, part of the process. My focus at this point is going to be on the bylaw itself and not the process in adopting it. But I know Christine is looking at that. Are there any counselors that, that have anything at this point they'd like to, to say? I know Shalini's the one that asked about the Northampton process um, last time. So Shalini. Yeah, I can just speak to that. Uh, what I was thinking, what was going in through my mind is that as we are creating uh, an open Amherst that's community oriented and all of our vision with full Amherst, and we're going through these processes of change, um, I mean, we, we could reinvent the wheel or we could look at communities, how they are doing it and see what works for us. And the intention for that is like there is a certain perception about Amherst and so either we come out with a very solid logic for what we are adopting and why and we are able to and we should be communicating that to all stakeholders that this is what we're doing this is why we're doing it and otherwise I think there continues to be that perception in people's minds that Amherst is not um, you know business friendly and yeah, so I, I mean, either it's a communication problem or there's actually a problem with our processes. And so whatever we decide, I think it's a good idea this time to take a pause, step back, see what other towns are doing that who we like and then learn from them. And then whatever we adopt, we should be able to have a very strong logic for why we're doing that. Thank you. Are there, beyond Northampton, are there other towns, um, Shalini, that you had in mind looking at? I think Northampton is the one we get compared with. The other one I could think of is Burlington, which is a college town and it's maintained its small town vibrancy and things that we like. So I've, uh, I have reached out to, I don't know what the exact process is for Northampton, I was trying to find it. So I've heard back from one of the ex-counselors and so I'm happy to go and gather more information or unless somebody already has that information. I, I was asking so that we, we can, as we move this conversation forward, know where to look and, and maybe assign people to go look in those ways. Um, we still don't have Chris Bratt Breaststroke back. Um, I would like to hear from potentially other counselors, um, particularly on CRC, but frankly on any counselor on their thoughts um, as it relates to bylaw changes, zoning bylaw changes, and and process. Andy, could I could I jump in for a quick sec? Sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, I just wanted to comment a little bit on. First of all, I, I did think uh, Gabrielle and, and Claudia's presentation was very good. And, and I think, you know, Rob, Chris and I and the rest of the staff um, across the board, and we're really talking about many different departments that get involved in permitting. Oftentimes people say, well, the second floor of town hall, but there's many other departments, including DPW and fire and others that get involved in permitting. But what I think is really important, and I look forward to their they're doing some survey work. They're doing some outreach work to their um, to their um, their constituents and those businesses, developers, et cetera. I think it's really important to kind of um, 
to 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 kind of name some things because this this whole it's difficult to do business in Amherst. We're we're you know we've we've done a lot of changes. I would say over the last ten years to make it um, easier and more efficient for people to do business in Amherst. And I think it's really important that if there are issues, we really need to put a put a we need to identify those because simply saying it's difficult to do do business in Amherst. And, and communicating that out as frequently as we hear it, it actually does a lot of damage. And I think what we need to do is really name it and have, have folks kind of own up to what it, what it is they're experiencing. And then we can take a look. Um, so we've made a lot of changes in our permitting in the way we've done business. We've brought many, um, many uh, departments together collaborating, but I think we also have to recognize that we have a very, very old and piecemeal zoning bylaw. And Rob and Chris can speak to that far more uh, in-depthly than I can, but it's, it's a hodgepodge of many, many different things, of generations of planning, generations of thinking. Steve was the chair of the planning board. He can speak to this. Um, I have seen so many planning board chairs and members of the planning board struggle with that zoning bylaw in my 15 years with the town. I think we also have to recognize where we've been as a town. So town meeting um, was, a, was an institution that could be very challenging for those people in town, who, including staff, who wanted to, and planning board members and, and um, zoning subcommittee members, who wanted to move forward progressive zoning uh, ideas in town. So I think we need to recognize where we've been, as Chalonet indicated, but then really identify those pieces that we can change. Um, this shouldn't be about individuals. It, it's not about individuals on boards or committees. It really should be about our process. And we do have a, a unique opportunity now with the council in your second year. Um, and honestly, with this, with this uh, pandemic in front of us, it's an opportunity to, to uh, restart uh, our downtown and our village center. So I think it's really important to take a look at the whole package and say, how do we address some of those shortcomings? And believe me, I've been in probably hundreds of conversations with Rob and Christine. They have many, many ideas, as does the zoning subcommittee. But let's take a look at the whole picture and then kind of move forward on those priority areas that make sense. I think we have been talking for quite a long time about 2020 being our year to address some of the zoning shortcomings. Well, we have a pandemic that none of us could have predicted and what a great time to really roll up our sleeves and say, what are the highest priorities in that zoning bylaw that we need to address? So I will stop there. Thank you, Dave. Um, I see a bunch of hands, so I'm just gonna go down the list and I'm gonna start with Evan. Yeah, thank you. Um, so you're asking for comments, I believe, on the process on this before. So last time uh, we met, which was my first CRC meeting, um, I expressed, of course, some reservation about exerting too many uh, opinions on the process that um, I was not involved in putting together. Uh, through my tenure in OCA, I'm very sensitive to the idea that you could work for months on a process uh, only to have people uh, tell you why it's wrong uh, who were not part of the, the process of putting it together. Um, that said, I think the flow chart you showed I've always liked. Um, I think it makes sense. It's very logical. It's very sensible. I really like the idea that the council voted on of having the joint hearings between CRC and, and the planning board. I think that that, that flow chart makes sense. The other document and the other proposal, um, which I expressed some concern about last time um, and had a really great explanation from, from both Mandy Jo and, and Chris on, uh, continues to, to sit sort of uncomfortably with me. The idea of saying that we have three times a year only that we are willing to consider uh, non, non time sensitive uh, zoning proposals. Um, and I think the reason for it is actually similar to what Dave just expressed, which was the idea that uh, we are in this new era of the council that provides us with all new opportunities, uh, namely 
the ability for year-round governance, uh, which differs significantly from when we had town meeting, when it was likely we could only consider zoning proposals two times a year. And so now we're saying, we used to be able to just do zoning proposals two times a year. Now we're in a whole new era and we can do it three times a year. And that to me doesn't actually sound all that exciting. And so I understand the rationale for it and I've had two weeks to sit on that and think about it. And I thought about it uh, more than I want to admit. Um, quarantine is getting a little isolating. Um, but having thought about it over that time, uh, I still feel some discomfort with only three times a year and the thought that if a zoning proposal is not ready for uh, October, but could be ready for November, then that person has to wait five months um, before it can be actually considered. And who knows what might be happening in those five months. I mean, certainly I would have hated if, if I had a zoning proposal ready to go in November 2019 to be told, oh, well, we have to wait until March um, of this year. Uh, and then all of a sudden we're not considering zoning proposals right now. Um, so I, I think that I still have some concerns about just saying we can only do it three times a year. And it, to me, it, it feels, uh, it doesn't feel like a step in the direction that I think a lot of us in the community were hoping we could move towards when we move from a, a town meeting system to a council system. Um, and I also am curious, uh, relatedly, uh, there's the, the term used of uh, zoning buckets or something like that, um, which is fun. And I'm, I'm just, Curious about bringing to the council, if it makes sense to be bringing big packages of zoning reforms as opposed to bringing them um, as they come. I think in some ways when those zoning reforms are really related to each other, it makes sense. But I think in other, in other ways, because zoning can be contentious and confusing and technical and time consuming, I worry about bringing a whole bunch of zoning proposals uh, that don't, aren't necessarily related to the council at once and, and the possibility of that overwhelming the council for a period of time. Um, so with that, I'll shut my camera in. Thank you, Evan. Um, Steve. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so <laughs> the zoning bylaw is really complicated in Amherst. So one of the reasons to do it three times a year is it takes a long time to get your head into it. And so even if it's different parts of the zoning bylaw, you know, basically to pick up that document and sort of understand it and understand the context of even what the smallest footnote change might be is a ton of work. It takes a ton of preparation just to re-understand the, the, the zoning bylaw each time. So that's the argument in favor of, that's one argument in favor of doing this in clusters. Back in the town meeting days, zoning bylaws could be considered anytime. So there could be, and I think there probably were, special town meetings that were called for a specific zoning bylaw. And I would assume in our case, and I'm sorry, I don't know exactly the details of this, but if there were an emergency zoning by bylaw or, or something that was considered urgent, then, then we could waive you know, that particular you know, provision. So I think, you know, I'm back to let's try it. You know, I think, oh, there's one more thing I want to say. There are 355 cities and towns in Massachusetts, and I believe that there are 355 different ways of doing zoning bylaws within the context of what Mass General Law does. So we in Amherst, which have our own unique way as to how we became a Amherst Town Council, uh, we should develop our own unique way of dealing with this particular issue. But I don't believe that we'll ever find another community that has the exact practice that we can adopt and use in the context in the way, in the context of how our particular government was formed. Thank you, Steve. Um, we're gonna keep going down the list. Lynn. Uh, so at the risk of David and Mandy Joe and Chris um, feeling like I'm being redundant, I'm going to raise another issue that I've raised before. And that is that this is a very big project. And it could tie the planning board up to the point that they don't get to anything else, or they never get to this. And so I want to go back to an idea that I've raised with Mandy Joe and David and Chris in the past. And that is that this actually become a special task force or commission and that it have representatives from planning, it have representatives from other groups 
that are affected by zoning bylaws and that it be provided with um, the staff support so that we actually take this opportunity of our having three years, no other council will have it. And we're three months into that three years uh, or four months actually um, at second year and actually have that body be the one that spends the time on this because I think the planning board already has their plates full and they will contribute immensely to this, but it's more than just a planning board job. And that's why I want us to go back to reconsidering that. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Um, for some counselors who may not have heard, um, this goes back to somewhat of what Rob was saying, was he's looking at um, doing a large set of revisions to the zoning bylaws to bring them more up to date and everything. And so is Chris Brestrup at this point. So, so the potential is that we're looking at um, receiving large chunks of bylaw changes sometime in the next 12 months or so to be able to be looking at that would um, not necessarily change the bylaws in terms of how they operate extensively, but it would change and update them as to how they're written um, is, is part of it. So I just wanted to put that in there for people who may not be familiar with some of the back conversations that have happened within the Community Resources Committee and, and all, and from conversations that both Chris and Rob have, have been a part of and mentioned to the Community Resources Committee. Um, at this point, uh, Shalini, you had something else to add, and then we're gonna hear from Alyssa. I just wanted to clarify that in no way did I want to suggest that uh, it's a flaw with Amherst or the town or any individual person because I have so much respect and now more than ever, I am so proud of every single person who's working in town. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that. And, I, and what I was emphasizing more is the fact that I do believe that we are very responsive to the different, you know, the changes that are happening. And it's probably a communication aspect. So if there have been changes, so it's what I'm sharing is not what I feel, but it's the perception in the community. And if that's the case, then what can we do to communicate more clearly, maybe that these, this is what we've done for you, we heard you, and here is what we're doing to bring those changes. So one is that communication aspect. And I totally acknowledge that, you know, that is who we were and because of what was the form of government then, and now this is where we are. So moving forward, what can we do? And I also don't want to upset the processes that uh, the CRC had been working on for so long, as Evan stated, but my intention was more again to highlight what was the logic for that so that we can communicate but it seems like we're open to discussing it anyways. So that's all. Thank you. Um, Alyssa. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm not sure if I've pressed the right button. I'm not sure if I've pressed the right button. We can hear you. Fantastic. I hate being that person who keeps saying, can you hear me? Um, I am, I really appreciate what Evan said about just as we experienced on OCA, I'm definitely not coming in and telling CRC what to do. I'm simply gonna share the same kind of thing I would share at a town council meeting when I heard this presentation because I think it might be useful to you now. So having been a representative town meeting member since 1999 until representative town meeting ended, and then serving on comprehensive planning, the select board starting in 2007, I hear the kinds of concerns people are bringing from this very long period of time and that extended way before me. I do wanna say that starting with town manager, Larry Schaefer, we changed our inspections around a lot. We always had good people working for us, but we took a more coordinated approach. And you all know that was several town managers ago. Some of you never even knew who Larry was. So we have made huge strides and, and I appreciate what Dave said about that because I know that that's continually a focus, whether it's through technology or just getting people together in the same room. At the same time, respecting what he said, that it was also my experience associated with 
how to come to representative town meeting with things. And again, that was twice a year, as a couple people have mentioned. And we actually had planning staff in the past who would say to a caller on the phone, I have this creative idea. And they'd say, you know what, I don't think representative town meeting is ever going to go for that. So I don't want to put our planning staff in that position in the future. And the capacity that we have now is certainly no greater than it was before. So I'm really nervous about expecting planning staff to be able to do this rewrite with the current resources because I don't see why it would happen now when it didn't happen before and what we're giving up in favor of this, especially when we're also working on rewriting the master plan, even though it's relatively minor rewriting. So I had not heard of this proposal for the three times a year because I'm not on CRC. Um, until we just got the document from Andy Joe recently. Thank you for sharing that with us, what not on CRC. And I share the concern about not being too rigid in the three times a year because that is absolutely not what people wanted when they went to a year round form of government. But I can respect the idea of maybe there's a way to communicate because all of this is about predictability, right? So if there's a way to communicate, you know, we're really not going to have any time to work on zoning during budget, some particular portion of the budget season. Like, don't try the bother trying to bring it to us then because you reflected that in your schedule when you came up with those three times you thought about what are other things we're doing and so maybe that's the level of predictability i'm not comfortable with suggesting that we move to this system of three times a year given where we are right now given the opportunities we have to make things feel different now that we have an elected town council that's very different than an elected representative town meeting. We no longer have an elected executive that never got the opportunity to say yes or no to some things because we never heard about them. The sooner that CRC and everyone can work together is great. And hearing Lynn's idea for the first time about a special task force that includes people affected, I think is fantastic. That sounds really good. So I, I really encourage you to look at those ideas some more and really consider the year round issue with the idea of giving people some ideas of practically speaking, we're not going to be likely to be able to work on something some parts of the year. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, Kathy. Hi, um, I just had a couple comments listening to other people's um, in terms of mentioning towns, the one I know that has revitalized quite successfully is Hanover and White River Junction um, with Dartmouth in it. And I don't know what was behind the scene there, how much of it was zoning law, so just a place to look um, what happened there. And then I went to a meeting, Chris will know exactly who we heard from, but it was on the zoning subcommittee pre-election and you invited a senior planner from Northampton to come in to talk about how they had gone through major changes in their zoning law moving toward design and and drawing concepts and what they i think it was a bit what lynn is talking about too because what you know, the sense was they had some big changes they wanted to make but they marshaled those at different points of time so they weren't all in one big package and then there were some smaller ones that went with the bigger changes that felt like they were going to be less controversial and people there would be broad consensus this is a good change so trying to think of um harder and less hard things to do um you know which is more sweeping less sweeping so she gave a few examples and she said you know the smaller ones that were like just cleaning up some wording and stuff they could package together and move more but they did more intensive work with hearings and bringing people along including people in the community for the bigger changes so it's a strategic way of saying you know where you might want to be going but you don't have to go there all at once um, at any different time period and and you're more likely to get all the way through then thank you kathy at this time i'd like to to go to chris and then rob um, to talk a little bit about chris um, what you and rob and and some of us have talked about but what you guys are thinking in the planning staff planning department inspectional department in terms of where you're going how you're working on zoning changes what they may look like or or the buckets that um, Evan talked about um, from what, we're gonna start with Chris. Chris is working on um, and the process that has happened in the past on how that would happen in 
and, and how you might foresee it happening here. Um, and then what Rob is, is working on in terms of the zoning changes he's looking at. So, so Chris, can you talk a little bit about that? I, I had to find my mute button. Um, yeah, so I think um, there are sort of two different scales, or maybe that's not a good word to use, but two different approaches that we're taking to the zoning bylaw. At least that was what we thought about the last time we actually spoke about this. I think Rob and I haven't talked about it in a while because there hasn't been an opportunity really to move forward with anything. Um, but what we had been talking about was that Rob would take the lead on um, kind of a rewrite of the zoning bylaw, including, um, you know, reorganization and putting things that made sense together and correcting some of the glaring conflicts or inconsistencies in the zoning bylaw. And um, some of the things that he knows that he works with on a daily basis that are just not working properly. And one example of that is the sign bylaw, but there are other things as well. And then there's another set of things, another approach, which is that there are specific issues that people in town really want to work on. And those issues include things like inclusionary zoning and parking and zoning in the downtown, whether that's um, reflecting the desires of people who want less development and less dense development, or whether it's people who want more development and more dense development, that all has to be sorted out. But those things are really bigger than the, um, or I shouldn't say bigger than, they're sort of too big to cope with in the context of a complete rewrite. They need attention on their own. And we felt that um, we probably needed some consulting help to help us out with those kinds of issues. Um, in order to reach consensus, because I think right now we don't have consensus. So, um, you know, going back to the downtown issue, I know that some people are really um, disappointed with uh, buildings that are five stories high and that are close to the sidewalk. Other people want to continue to build buildings that are reflecting that model. And so we need to reach a consensus about what do we really want and how far do we want that to go from the edges of the BG district into the BL? So that's something that really needs um, public attention. It needs meetings. It needs people to come together with different points of view and reach a consensus about what it is we want to do um, before we can really move ahead with those things. The same thing with inclusionary zoning. Inclusionary zoning is difficult and complicated. And we, we think, I think we need some cons consultation, consultant help on that. Um, the things that Rob is dealing with, Rob's done this twice before in two different towns and he thinks um, that he has a good approach to this um, rewrite of the entire zoning bylaw. So um, I think that both things can happen at the same time. Um, and there may be, you know, while Rob is moving along with his rewrite, there may be things that he wants to pull out and flag as things that you know can't be coped with in this um, in this mechanism. So we need to pay more attention to them and hold some public forums or whatever. Um, so I guess those are the two different tracks or two different approaches that I see that could uh, progress simultaneously. So does that um, help? That does. Rob, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yes. Um, so what um, Chris nicely referred to as Rob's rewrite, I just want to make clear that that would be us working with the zoning subcommittee pretty extensively. Um, and, and I think um, ju just to, you know, emphasize it a little bit more is that really what we want to do is start from everything from the, uh, the structure and uh, um, kind of the, the format of the bylaw. Uh, as simple as getting it into an electronic format, one that's searchable and easily used on the website, um, and, and looking at the structure of how the, the sections and articles work together, uh, identifying all those inconsistencies and errors and problematic uh, pieces, uh, and uh, working with Zoning Subcommittee and Planning Board immediately to identify those larger issues that really could use some consultant help 
and larger uh, planning efforts to to or evaluating uh, where we go next steps. Um, where we are, uh, you know, late mid February, late February, we met with the planning board and we we received their support to move ahead with this. So moving ahead meant. Uh, you know, Christine and I would be at the, the, the next available zoning subcommittee meeting to start talking about this and working on it. So uh, unfortunately that never occurred and that's where we are today. So we're, you know, we're anxious to get going on that, uh, start producing some work and working with the zoning subcommittee initially uh, to have something to bring forward to the other uh, boards and committees. Thank you, Rob. Um, I'm, I'm gonna take the chair's privilege here and, and put some comments in for myself. Um, you know, I, I joined CRC back in October, kind of jumped into all of this and started approaching when these referrals came through, how are we gonna do zoning? How are we gonna work with the planning board from a, as some people have said, from the process of what we've done before. And then, you know, and that's sort of where we've been moving, but looking at what's legally required. And then Shalini last, meeting and Evan um, you know brought up well is this the right way to do it um, and so that got me thinking uh, despite having proposed something and drafted that document there that um, yeah planning board is very busy right now they've got a master plan they update that they're working on and they've always got all the regulatory stuff going on and so I started thinking when Chris Brestrup it described what Northampton does and that zoning changes that like what Rob was just talking about, instead of going to a zoning subcommittee or planning board and working extensively with them first, in Northampton, they pretty much work with the equivalent of CRC first. It got me thinking of saying, is that a better model? And I don't know what the answer to that is. So it's been, I, I really appreciate hearing from Alyssa and, you know, Lynn and, and Kathy on on from non CRC member point of views, what what they're thinking and all and then and then our new CRC members because maybe it is time to rethink the whole process. Um, that in prior years really did sit with planning board, maybe that given our new government is not where it needs to sit even an extensive revision, maybe we need a for the extensive revisions that Rob and Chris were talking about a special task force or maybe CRC is the one that it goes to first. Um, and I think that's something that we need to be discussing in CRC, um, which is why I appreciate having more of the counselors here today to be able to hear their thoughts on that because ultimately it would be a council decision to make um, because I'm starting to rethink that whole process and wondering if given time constraints with planning board and how other cities operate, maybe planning staff comes to maybe the, the better option is that planning staff brings those revisions to the council subcommittee first before they go through other things. Um, and so, you know, I, I personally would like to hear people's thoughts on that, what Lynn suggested, what we've already got proposed, where people stand and what they think might be a, a right now we've got a, at least three proposals out there for how they start where, where planning staff goes um, and what people think might be the best one. We're not going to obviously have time to settle that today at today's meeting, um, but figuring that out, I think is gonna become vitally important as, as Rob and Chris begin working on those changes. So any thoughts on that? Shalini. Oh, um, uh Maybe we could gather information. Um, you know, we, we could come up with our own way, like the task force. I think that sounds really smart thing to do. It sounds like, duh, but that seems like a really, it would be a win-win, but there might be other towns who've considered it. And so just, to, I think we can come up with our own way as Steve was suggesting, but I think it would be worthwhile to talk to a few towns and see why they landed on their particular process. What were the pros and cons? And so we can do some homework and assign it. And then when we meet next time, we have some pros and cons on the different uh, configurations. Um, Sarah. Okay, so I'm jumping in because, and I will say that I'm new to all of this. And this is my first CRC meeting due to illness. Um, but just to weigh in so that you know I'm actually here and listening 
to what everyone's saying. Um, the task force appeals to me. Um, just if you want to get my off the cuff, I just jumping right straight into this. That sounds appealing to me, but I, I do see, um, you know, I'm willing to look at things the way Shalini is saying that maybe we need to maybe look at some other things that people do. But if you want to get a consensus right now, that's the way I'm leaning, um, even though I don't know a whole heck of a lot right now. Thanks. Are there any other immediate comments um, at this point, particularly from non-CRC members, simply because CRC will have the next meeting to chat about this too, um, where we won't have others. Um, and so I, I want to take the opportunity to those that no, don't normally have the ability to, you know, contribute to a CRC meeting if they want to contribute now. Let, I'd love to hear that. I had Andy raised his hand and then raised it, lowered it. So I guess Andy doesn't have anything at this point. Nope. And then there's Alyssa. So let's do Alyssa and then Andy. So just quickly, I'm sure you already thought of this, and I maybe just missed it in the presentation, but um, checking in with the planning board members, since many of them are not, have not been serving for a terribly long time, just so that they understand what, where we're going with this, so that when they hear this meeting, they don't feel like, hey, wait a minute, <laughs> they're leaving us out. But also, I'll bet that some of them have been thinking, you know, I wish we did it like my friend said they do it over in this other place. So I think finding out from them when you're talking about homework assignments like Shalini was talking about might in fact also prove to be very useful and show clearly that we are in no way trying to take their jobs away from them. We're just trying to make it work better for everybody. Thank you. Andy. Yes, thank you. I waited a long time because I've been on the committee before and I was very interested to see how the conversation went and it made me very much appreciate the fact that we did shuffle committees a little bit and brought some fresh perspective into it. I think that what we were probably doing in the first round of the committee was thinking about the uh, planning board partly with a misunderstanding possibly of what the role of the planning board was by statute, which is where we need some help from probably our planning staff uh, just to understand what is the role of the planning board. But uh, it sounds like from the experiences of other cities that we um, read that power of the planning board uh, we weren't correct in our reading of it, uh, and I, it, it kind of froze, a, for, at least in speaking for myself, got me into a place where I was trying to tr um, be respectful of the planning board, being respectful of the council, and uh, it does sound like um, we're going in the right direction, and I really appreciate the effort that all of you have put in to the two meetings since I have no longer been on the committee. Thank you, Andy. Um, Dave Zomek. Thanks, yeah, I just had two quick um, comments um, on a task force. Um, number one, I'm having deja vu as Mandy Joe and Rob and Chris and Lynn will know you know, some of us were talking about a task force or a group. Actually, we've been talking about that for a couple of years now, but I think going back mid-2019, we spent a lot of time talking about a separate entity that might include zoning um, subcommittee members or planning board um, members. So it's an intriguing concept. It, it certainly is, and and I, I recognize the... Um, the amount of work that's on um, the planning board and the zoning subcommittee now with the master plan and, and their regular permitting work. Um, the thing I think that's most important to me, and, and I think Claudia and, um, and Gabrielle might be still on the call, is how do we make sure we get the input from the business community? To me, whether that comes through a task force or whether that comes through the CRC or whether that comes through the zoning subcommittee, I think it's essential, you know, we are, we all want to do what's right for the town moving forward, but we do need to gather that input from those people who, who have been doing business in Amherst for many years, who, are, who want to continue to do business post 
COVID-19 who want to invest in downtown Amherst. So to me, you know, it's really important that we get that input, how we get it. I think there are many different ways we could get it. It could come through the zoning subcommittee. It could come through CRC. It could come through a, a task force. Um, I just want to make sure we don't create an unnecessary layer um, uh, that's not there now. But um, so I think there's pros and cons to all of them. But I do think we need to get out there with these ideas that are going to be developed by staff with input from both um, planning board members, uh, council members, and the general public. Um, but we, we want to have buy-in from the community, you know, whether it's we love five-story buildings. We hate five-story buildings. We want form-based code. We don't. We want um, inclusionary zoning. To what degree do we want inclusionary zoning? And what's that right mix of inclusionary zoning that doesn't um, uh, 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 tamp down the, the potential for more redevelopment and, and taxable growth in village centers? So I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, Andy, and then Shalini, and then I think we're going to move on. Andy, you'll need to unmute. I didn't mean to have my hand up and I was having problems with my computer. <laughs> Sorry. Both at the same time. Okay, thank you, Andy. Shalini. I wanted to speak to one thing that Dave just mentioned about gathering info from stakeholders and I want to expand not just businesses, but stakeholders could include university researchers who are doing uh, and all that. But this, the important thing there is I, I asked the bid and the chambers if they could be the people collecting that information. And I say that because I've reached out as a counselor to speak to some developers and what were some, and I said, you'll be anonymous. I'm not going to share your name in any way. And uh, but they were hesitant to share their input because they feel there might be a backlash if they are identified because they still have to work in this community. So I found there was a hesitation amongst businesses or stakeholders to share honestly what the loopholes are or where they're feeling stuck. So having uh, someone like the bid to collect the information and keep it really anonymous and bring that whole information to us would be really useful rather than having a, a zoning or a CRC or such committee. That's my sense. Thank you, Shalini. Um, I think at this time we're going to move on. This is obviously a conversation that's going to take a couple more meetings to, to, to resolve and figure out a plan and a process to propose to the full council. Um, and I think I will think about potentially assigning some research to people or talking to uh, town staff through Dave Zomack about maybe information we can get um, prior to a next meeting on some things. Um, but I'm not going to take the time at this meeting to to go through assignments or anything, but I will think through that um, and see what we can do. At this time, I am aware that um, the council agenda, I think, has been complete. The CRC agenda has two more items on it. Um, does this mean, does Lynn want to adjourn the council portion of the meeting at this time? Um, I'd or like to like see to how many people want to stay on, because if they want to stay, then we can't. I'm happy to have them on for the two other items. It is meeting times of CRC and adoption of CRC minutes. I I don't need to stay on. Okay. Then those people that do not want to stay on at this point, please just leave the meeting. And then I can tell you whether I've got a- CRC members do not leave the meeting. <laughs> yeah, CRC has to stay. All right. Uh, then let me call the council meeting of the committee of the whole adjourned. Thank you. So the council meeting is adjourned at 349. The town, the CRC meeting is still continuing. Um, we are moving on to our next item, which is meeting times general discussion. Um, this is 
a, oh, and I want to, I think Rob's already gone, um, but I want to thank Chris and Rob for attending and all and contributing to the meeting. We will be back in touch, obviously. Um, CRC, moving on to CRC meeting times, we have to figure out a time to meet on a regular basis. Um, that can be a problem when, I, I did not repost, I don't think, the, um, the last survey, but we did a survey of meeting times and there was not a single half an hour window between Monday at 8 a.m. and Friday at 10 p.m. that all five of us were available to meet, um, which is why we then pulled for just this meeting. I am wondering if Tuesdays, and when I did that poll, I included the Wednesday morning 8.30 time that has generally been the CRC time and a whole bunch of other times. Um, during this crisis, Dave Zomek, our staff liaison, has indicated that mornings can be a little bit tougher, although I think those meetings he has had, um, care, uh, I don't know, core meetings, the COVID response team meetings, generally in the mornings on Wednesdays. Um, I don't know whether those have, I know they've lessened from seven days a week, but I don't know whether Wednesdays are still one of the days that they tend to be but um, he had expressed at least during this time a preference for not mourning at 8.30 simply so he could attend these meetings and also be a part of the COVID meetings. Um, I noticed in the responses for, last, for this week and next week that Tuesdays and Thursdays around two o'clock tended to be okay. So the question I have for our committee members is between now and say August, are Tuesdays or Thursdays generally okay at 2 p.m.? And if that is the case, um, could we maybe set a time for either Tuesday or Thursday at 2 p.m.? It would be on a potentially every other week basis and then revisit this in August when we might have some of us an idea of what our fall semester schedules might look like. Um, but maybe we can get ourselves through with meeting times on a standard basis until August. So I'd like to hear from each of you on whether Tuesday or Thursday at 2 p.m. on approximately twice a month basis would be doable. So I'm just going to go down people's names. So we'll start with Sarah since she raised her hand. <laughs> so um, I could do either but let's say Tuesday would be my preference, but I can do either. So that's fine. Although one thing I would like to say is that I am hoping maybe in the fall or when things get back to normal, we might be able to start meeting in evening times, but I'm just putting it out there because I don't know anybody else's schedule. So thanks. Um, Shalini. Uh, I can do Tuesday or Thursday, two to four. Evenings are generally hard for me because of, a lot of my classes are in the evening six to eight thirty but we can see like I normally keep Mondays obviously I don't have any classes on Mondays I don't have any classes on Friday evenings which is that's family time and I don't have classes on Thursday evenings because that's when we normally have our district meetings so for my personal work I can only have classes twice a week so if we have a committee meeting then that makes it hard for me to have it um, Shalini, would you said Thursdays you don't have classes because you tend to have district meetings on Thursdays once so a month on on non district meeting nights mm -hmm. would you be able to meet on a Thursday evening potentially potentially yeah mm -hmm. okay Evan uh, so short answer. Yes, Tuesdays and Thursdays uh, at 2 p.m. work for me, um, both in the summer, but also in the school year. Uh, I don't know about Steve, but my uh, teaching schedule is set for the fall already. The students are already enrolled. Um, and so I know uh, Tuesday and Thursday at 2 p.m. is a, a, time, a good time, both in the summer, and I could also do that um, throughout the school year. Uh, between the two, preference between Tuesday and Thursday, uh, only a, a slight preference for Thursday, um, only because I have a standing five o'clock commitment on Tuesdays and that I need to be able to eat dinner before. Uh, so it's certainly doable, but it's 
there's just a little bit more cushion if it's on Thursdays. Um, and I also, it looks likely that TSO is going to be meeting on Thursday nights. Um, so I'd almost rather just have my committees back to back like they are today. Um, if we're going to move more towards nights, then it would have to be Thursday over Tuesday. I could not do Tuesday um, evenings, and I'm perfectly fine with Thursday evenings as long as they are not, um, here's where I'm going to be obnoxious, as long as they are not the same as TSO Thursdays. Um, and also, I have a different committee meeting uh, the second Thursday of every month. So um, it, it might get tricky on Thursday evenings, but I can certainly try and make it work. But for the near term, Tuesday, Thursday, 2 p.m. is fine. <laughs> Steve. So I'm not going anywhere between here and August. So um, any time is fine. So Tuesday or Thursday. So um, when the school year starts and if travel ever starts again, then Tuesdays are much better for me because I often travel Thursday, Friday, Saturday. But right now with everyone on lockdown, I can do Anytime you want, middle of the night. Um, you know, it's, and when we get back into it, I prefer during the day. I would much prefer beginning of the day or end of the day. Evenings are really hard already, so we're already giving up. Um, well, I should say we're already investing one evening, so it'd be hard for me to give up more than one, two evenings per month for you know for the town council. And also, there are other public bodies that meet in the evenings, like planning board, et cetera, et cetera. But let's go either one, but um, I would prefer Tuesday in the long run. And also Tuesday at two to four also works for me in the fall. Okay, so given that I think for now, um, as long as Sarah, it sounds like you're the one that prefers mainly evenings, but are you okay with two to four on Tuesdays through August? And then we'll revisit with a potential for Thursday evenings, although Thursday evenings are going to be a problem. We, we need to revisit that, but we might pull for, Steve said, late afternoons, um, end of day, which might be able to be a nice bridge between daytime and evening time for potentially Shalini and Steve and you and and me um, but but I think for now I will propose a schedule that is Tuesdays two to four um, I will get that out to people so that we can formally vote on that and get it published at the next meeting but I will send proposed dates there I'm not going to sit here and go through those dates now um but but we'll get a document out um but but to plan on potentially every other week for now um if we don't need one because things are slowing down or something we will certainly cancel um but the next one would be i think in approximately two weeks tuesday two to four um and i'm going to take the tuesdays because more people prefer that. So Evan, you lost that preference, sorry. Um, but um, you get your hour and hopefully we'll be able to end in under two hours in the future. Um, so with that, that is not a vote at this point. So we're not doing any roll call. We have the minutes to do. And I have, we have one set of minutes for the last meeting, April 8th. Um, I had a couple of changes, so I want to put on my screen those minutes if I can find them again. Um, so let me, let me see what I can do with that because I had a couple of changes. And so let me see, there we go. And so I'm gonna see if anyone else has any other changes. The changes I have when I find them here, I think, we're towards the end. Angela took our minutes at the last meeting. Yes, so the only thing I had was to the minutes section. Um, and then I just noticed we don't have the documents. I'll have to add the documents in, the documents we referenced. But the minutes, um, we made changes. So I wanted to note that we discussed them. And I wanted to note that the motion was to adopt the minutes as they were amended with those changes. Um, so that's the only changes I had. Did anyone else have any changes to the minutes? 
I am not seeing any hands raised, so I'm going to take that to mean no one else has any changes. So I will make the motion to adopt the minutes as seen on these amendments, so as amended along with the additional amendment of adding the documents referenced. So that's just gonna be adopt the minutes as amended. Is there a second to that motion? Shalini second. Thank you, Shalini. Um, are there, is there any discussion? Seeing no discussion, um, I am going to unshare my screen and then take a roll call vote. Um, so as I call your name, unmute yourself and vote yay, nay, or abstain to adopting the minutes. Um, Shalini. Yay. Mandy is a yay. Um, Evan. Yay. Uh, then Steve. Unmute Steve. <laughs> <laughs> we make, I, I think he is a yes, but we still need to hear it because <laughs> it's a roll call. Hit the space bar, hold it down. The damn space bar wasn't working. Don't put that in the minutes. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Sarah. So can I just ask a question? But raising my hand. Yes. My Okay, my understanding was that if you hadn't been there, you could not vote yay. So I'm just asking that question quickly before I vote. You can vote yay, you can vote abstain. You don't have to have attended the meeting in order to vote to approve the minutes, but it's generally up to whoever's voting to decide whether they want to abstain or, or vote yes or no. Okay, so I'm gonna say that usually I abstain, but I'm, I'm it, we can, you and I could have a private conversation later about how you feel about people doing that. So I'm gonna abstain from now and then we can talk about it. Excellent. So that vote is 4-0 with one abstention. Um, and the abstention is Sarah Swartz. Um, with that, I believe, let me pull up my agenda. We are on to uh, announcements. I do not have any. If anyone else has any announcements or unanticipated items, please hit your raise hand button so I know because um, I don't have any announcements. The next meeting agenda preview at this point, I'm not sure what it'll look like. It will probably include things very similar to what this meeting did, which is zoning bylaw process and potentially economic development, depending on what we receive on that document that we had requested from the chamber and um, anyone else. I think Shalini looks to raise her hand so Shalini, do you have anything that you would like to see on the next meeting agenda or any unanticipated items? Oh, Alyssa brought up the economic development director question and I wonder if that's something the whole town council should be discussing or the CRC should be discussing that is that something or is that Paul's decision? Um, I can't answer that one right now. Um, I think I will talk to Dave and Paul maybe about it. Um, Dave's got his hand raised, so maybe he has a way to address that. Yeah, so thanks for the question. So um, before the COVID-19 situation started, um, as was talked about a while ago, we did do some pretty extensive um, listening sessions with the bid, the chamber, um, opinion leaders in the community, et cetera, et cetera, stakeholders, many stakeholders. So we gathered a lot of information um, and we had kind of set a course forward to, to uh, begin to um, um, get, that, get that search process going. I think now the playing field has changed pretty dramatically. And um, you know, what we heard from the bid and chamber and I didn't chime in earlier was that, you know, in large part, we might be looking for a different person than we were three or four months ago. Um, because we may need somebody to help rebuild our, what is left of our, our downtown and our village centers. But um, I know it's on Paul's radar screen. I think the last five weeks we have been, you know, full on COVID response, but I'm sure that he will be talking with me and with our HR director, Evelyn, about um, next steps in that process. So, you know, I would encourage you as individual counselors to, you know, 
contact him, but I know it's on his radar screen and, and I know it's a high priority for him. So. Thank you, Dave. Any other agenda items or anything else? I am seeing nothing, so we are unfortunately five minutes late, so I apologize for going over, um, but I am going to adjoin, adjourn the meeting at 4.05. I want to thank Pam for taking minutes today and for Athena for setting up the meeting um, so that we could go. So thank you, Pam, and we are adjourned at 4.05. You're welcome. Thank you, Pam. Thank You're you, welcome. Tina. Wait until after you read them. That, that will be the true count. Oh, no. We appreciate you. Regardless, <laughs> it's unconditional appreciation. <laughs> All right. Have a good night, everybody. It's been my pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Good night.